I can hear you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we're gonna get started with our panel. We have with here today, Michelle Drucker, Bertha Vasquez, and Amy Clement. And first up, Miss Vasquez, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, and, and, you and I think Michelle needs to unmute, right? I think she's muted, so. Yeah, when she speaks, she'll. I'm... Okay, there you are, hey. <laughs> Hey, Robert. I don't have any video, but um... that's OK. So OK, great. Let's get going. Um, so my name is Bertha Vasquez. I'm a science teacher at Carver Middle School, and I've been there 30 years now. I was Gianna's teacher and so proud of everything you guys are doing here. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, a little bit about yourself. Hi, I am Michelle Drucker. I am a lifelong Floridian, the mother of three, and the environmental chair of the Miami-Dade County Council, as well as the sustainability chair for MAST Academy. And good friends with Bertha Vasquez, who taught my oldest child at Carver and really got me involved in the parent uh, piece of trying to help green schools. That's amazing. Yes, I'm super familiar with the work that you do in Dreaming Green. My school competes in it and I've done a couple of those competitions. It's amazing that organization. So thank you for helping put that together. So I want to hear a little bit about the work that you do that helps to fight climate change. So Ms. Vasquez. Sure, I think I'd be I'm good to start because what I'm going to say is going to lead to what Michelle is doing, which is amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I have a video. It's like six minutes long. Do you think it's is it possible to share? Go for it. Share it. Okay. So this is the thing, and I was listening to your earlier panel. Um, how do you deal with climate deniers? How do you deal with, with other situations? And I think there's this false choice, and Al Gore has been talking about this forever, that the economy is here and the environment is here. That is a false choice. And one of the ways you can talk to a climate denier, like we're all here because we care. I, I like care about the polar bears. I care about you guys. I care about the young people. It drives me crazy that the old people are making decisions and you're the ones who are gonna face this head on. I mean, it's coming fast, but you're the ones who are really gonna face it. So how you, if you gotta learn how to talk to different people. And what I, how I talk to people that are maybe not as interested is I talk money because just like we can save the environment we can just make a uh, change the u.s economy and shift it towards the future i always say you know what happening what's happening right now is the candle makers and the horse breeders are stopping the light bulb and the internal combustion engine old technology is stopping new technology think about what the car and the light bulb did for the United States. So when you see someone that's not, doesn't really care about the environment or might be not as convinced when they obviously should be, shift and talk about money. And this is, a, I, I wanna say, give a shout out to Anuka Jorda because she's really carried on the traditions of Carver, which I'm about to show you in this video and has done such amazing things at Carver and that, of course, is a segue to Michelle, who has a lot more to say, I think, than I do, because she is doing it. She's scaling it up. She did. She's doing what I did at Carver and what Anouk is continuing to do at Carver. She's trying to get it uh, district-wide. And listen carefully in the video. One of the kids is going to tell you, if we do, do district-wide, what happened at Carver a few years back, we can save. $33 million as a school district. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Boy, I say that like, you know, 50,000 times a day. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you what can happen when you talk about money and not just about the environment. You could really convince people that otherwise would not be on board with you. For example, this lady I'm showing you right here, her name's Nicole Martinez. Her, her dad totally wasn't on board until Nicole convinced him to get uh, um, Energy Star appliances for his building downtown. And the guy was saving thousands of dollars a month. So maybe he's not an environmentalist, but everybody wants to save thousands of dollars a month. And that's what the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is also, which Michelle will talk about. It 
all started, we were in sixth grade. We were concerned about climate change. Because of sea level change, Miami, out of all the coastal cities in the world, will have the greatest economic loss. Did you all get goosebumps? I just got goosebumps. At a certain <laughs> point, we couldn't stop thinking, is there anything that we can do? I'm Nicole Martinez. I'm Melissa Quintana. I'm Madeline Cowan. I'm Larissa Weinstein. And, and we're, we're in the green team. team. The green team would go around from homeroom to homeroom, telling students about one thing that they could do to reduce their carbon footprint. We started by turning off computers. We began to recycle. We turned off lights. We actually weather stripped the doors and windows so that the air can't escape to conserve air conditioning. We turned off the AC units. Instead, we opened the windows and the doors. We could hear birds singing outside. There are so many little things that you can do that will save energy and money. Throughout the school year, we had this thing called the greenometer. It was a thermometer. But we would save energy that we were saving. We became a Dreaming Green School, which is a nonprofit that helps us to save energy, reduce our carbon footprint. We saved tens of thousands of dollars. We learn how our actions affect the environment and affect something greater than ourselves. My friends and I called in somebody to give us an estimate on putting in solar panels. The man who came in emphasized that before we need to do this, we can try to reduce our energy consumption. And one of the great ideas that he gave us was to paint the roof of our school white. We convinced them to actually donate all the materials, the time, and the manpower to paint the roof of our school white. Painting the roof white saved us thousands of dollars. It didn't require as much air conditioning that translated directly to money savings. We didn't just do this ourselves. We built an entire network with um, faculty, administration students, and other members of the community. Our principal allowed us to look at energy bills, so we were able to do an energy audit on the entire school. And you can go online to put in your address, and it does energy audits. It gives you graphs on how much you're saving or what exactly. you can do. It gives you tips. Yeah. And I it think that's It compares it to the same month right. of the previous year. It just became an incredible project. It became something beyond my wildest dream. And all of our teachers were very helpful. We spoke with the custodians and convinced them to play a part in going green. Sure, Thanks, I'll please. Back. Thank you. If we custodians should see an air condition on, we turn it off. So we are going green up, and I'm proud to say that. We were able to uh, vastly decrease the amount of energy our school used. Going green is a win-win situation for everybody. My eighth grade year, we saved $39,000. And then the year after that, we saved another 14000 If each school in the district were to implement these, we would have saved $33 million. That's awesome. Larissa, Maddie, Melissa, and Nicole wanted to go beyond the classroom with what they had learned about energy and environmental science and make a difference in their school and community. We made a presentation for school board members about how the entire district could be more environmentally friendly. They were extremely inspired and they also saw the financial benefits of going green. The savings were astronomical. It was exciting to go to these school board members. You could show them the data. You could say, look, you have no idea how much money you could be saving. Our students went and spoke to the authorities at the Miami International Airport. Throughout our presentations with the school board chairman, with um, Miami International Airport, we emphasized that it doesn't take that much to reduce your energy consumption. I, I'm going to stop there because I want to give other people time. Um, I can go ahead and put this link in the chat for everybody if they want to see everything else. But I think uh, Michelle Drucker is scaling up what happened in one school and trying to make it happen district wide. And I certainly don't want to take any more time for my presentation. That's amazing. Thank you for that video. Those young women and what they've been doing at their school. That is super cool and super inspirational. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Decker. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, oh, boy. Let's see. Can I not share directly from? My oh, screen? yeah. Sorry. I have to stop sharing. Now your turn. Okay. Let's see. It says. Out at the bottom. Oh, there it is. Screen. Got it. Okay, share, and this is the one. Okay, so thank you, uh, Bertha, and I wanna just really emphasize that what I came away from working with Bertha at Carver with my oldest was that when parents and teachers 
uh, collaborate, they can really scale up and do, you know, just tremendous things. We participated in the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow, just another one of Bertha's incredible legacies and helped win $140,000 for uh, Carver Middle with, um, with technology because the kids did a, a science-based uh, community service project. And that was my aha moment. Like, wait a minute, you know, parents can, can, can leverage their, um, you know, their roles in a way that sometimes teachers can't. So I I'm gonna you're talk- not sharing your screen yet, though. Oh, I'm not. I see it no. for myself. It's not there. No. Huh? You can click on the, the screen, make it blue, and then hit share. Okay, wait. Um, I'm in what uh, display over other apps. What was that? Uh, I'm sorry. Shoot. It's okay. I'm get, I'm getting a little nervous because I'm not. I, I see it on my screen. Am I? I'm still in though, right? We totally hmm. hear you. Let me go back. Let me go back. Always email it to me, and I'll put it up on my screen for you. This is the teaching thing where we have to solve a thousand tech problems a day. <laughs> I have two. I have two. Um, okay. Let me try this again. All right. Well, we can give you a moment to help you figure it out. Um, let us know if you need any help. Ms. Vasco is totally offered to share it for you if you want to send it to her real quick. Um, in the meantime, Ms. Clement, maybe you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Amy Clement. I am a professor at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. Um, I also am trying to share, but it says only host can share, so I'm not a host yet. So. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to share. Michelle may be having the same problem. Um, so I can happy to send my my PowerPoint to Ms. Vasquez also. Oh, there she goes. Okay. So Who's sharing? I'm, me or Mich Michelle is, says it's started oh. sharing. Michelle is sharing. Okay. This is a you, you guys want to start? Sorry. It says has started. There we go. Woohoo! It says has started. Thank you. I'll use my screen, and I am just going to hope that um, you guys can hear me and everything goes smoothly. And I'm going to try to do this as a lightning round as well. Um, again, my name is Michelle Drucker. I'm the environmental chair for the Miami-Dade County Council. And I wanna thank uh, inspiring teachers like uh, Bertha Vasquez and Wafa Khalil and Anouk Jorda and Pam Schlackman. And also a shout out to the University of Miami ABBA Center and their sustainability officer, Teddy Lutelier, who have really uh, provided great support and expertise in helping us come up with this idea to promote a green print for Miami-Dade schools. So this first image is a coastal restoration with Frost Science, another one of our partners and our students. This part of Virginia Key is the only area that didn't erode during Hurricane Irma because it was planted with native coastal plants. Um, that's interesting. Now I can't seem to get it to forward. Okay, so here I'm sure I don't need to say why you guys speak for the trees. Um, you, you're here, you care, and uh, I just really enjoy the, that slide. Maybe also you've just been overwhelmed by the, the headlines and you just can't kind of put it, you know, suppress it anymore and you want to be part of a solution. For me, my drive comes from where I grew up on the Indian River Lagoon in Martin County, the most biodiverse waterway in North America. It's uh, still not a very densely populated place. And when I was little, there was one traffic light and not a lot of kids. So I spent a lot of time in those waterways with my Labrador retriever, um, just picking up hermit crabs, marine life, and really fell in love with those waterways. Um, I was about as you know hyper as our, our young puppy lab and the neighbor would call my mother and say, there's a river in her pajamas again with the, um, that's, I spent a lot of my time in, the, in those waterways. But today where I work is on the Miami River and I see the manatees that breed there that are constantly trying to navigate the 
the trash, the um, degraded water, um, the big power boats and the barges. It's an industrial waterway. And as well, I see the sea level rise. It's kind of a narrow waterway. And it is, it's scary to think in just my career, I have noticed the increase in sea level rise, uh, especially during King Tides. And that photo on the right is right from my office the day that Al Gore finished doing his Climate Reality Corps training. And he was standing there taking a group photo and the, the water was right there. I just happened to stumble on it. And um, it, it just a constant reminder all around us. So those moments made me say, well, what can I do? I'm an attorney with the Department of Homeland Security. And I had that moment, like, especially after working with Bertha and I was formerly in the Peace Corps and I, recognize that you know community efforts coming together we all bear some responsibility and i believe and do what you can you know where you are with what you have um, my agency has a climate action plan and i discovered it after looking for it because i felt like there must be some way that i can play a bigger role and to my delight and amazement and reassurance i discovered the sustainability plan which really um outlines the key things that we need to be doing to reduce our environmental impacts and cost. It was a real aha moment for me. All federal, tw all 22 federal agencies are obliged to have a climate action plan. Uh, the federal government is the biggest consumer of energy in our economy, biggest employer in our economy. We're talking the Department of Defense and you know DHS, Department of State, Smithsonian, NASA, all the usual suspects. And these are the key things that we should be doing to really you know, reduce our emissions like what Bertha students just did at Carver, um, painting the roof white, turning off uh, electricity, reducing your energy consumption. Uh, the facilities people like to say, you've got to eat your energy efficiency vegetables before you can have your solar desserts. So I, we took these principles and tried to communicate to our em employees how they can incorporate sustainability into their day-to-day -day operations. And we made connections with all of the subject matter experts in Miami, like uh, Bike 305, University of Miami's uh, Sustainability 101, um, Water and Sewer, the uh, resiliency uh, communities. And we presented this information to our employees. And then once I started doing that, I realized sustainability is everywhere. In the corporate world, 90% of Fortune 500 companies pursue what they call the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits. So you have Disney that's been carbon neutral since 2011, and they have a, a, a food harvest waste plant, which creates a closed loop system of collecting all of the food waste from those parks and reducing the methanes and turning it into energy. Uh, they also have incorporated carbon pricing into their internal operations to really reduce their impact on the environment. Walmart has gigaton of carbon out of the atmosphere, the equivalent of taking all of the cars off the road, which uh, is, um, you know, what surprised me is that Walmart, it's not the building itself that generates so much greenhouse gases, it's the supply chain. It's how they get all their products into the store, how those products are produced. That's actually surprisingly the biggest impact of their uh, emissions. And then Project Drawdown. That also is another exciting solutions-based uh, green print on how to reduce emissions. And some of the top ones are directly implicated in schools, which is reduced food waste, plant-rich diet, tropical forests, solar rooftop, and educating girls. And kids know this too, like they are driving the change. And at Mast Academy in 2017, uh, Delaney Reynolds addressed our kids and they spontaneously voted for a zero net energy school. And for them, it seemed effortless to make this request because they know about Tesla, they know about solar, they know about wind, they know about food waste and composting, and they see this big disconnect between how their schools are operating and what they're learning about the um, conservation methods and technology that we should be adopting now. The PTA has a very powerful position on uh, renewable energy and carbon neutral energy efficient schools. So parents can really leverage that um, high ground to, to really insist on changes in our school setting. 
So when the kids asked for uh, a zero net energy school, I thought, okay, well, we'll just use the Miami-Dade school sustainability plan, like the one they have at DHS. And to my astonishment and disappointment, there's no plan. There's not even a website that highlights sustainable practices in our school. You can't even figure out if there's recycling in the district. There's nowhere to go. And it's a huge problem uh, that, that we really wanna see addressed with the school district. You know, you can't put it on the shoulders of teachers like Bertha Vasquez to be responsible for school operations. That's not her job. So the other districts, the big ones in the country, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, they all have sustainability plans, even Palm Beach County. So the next best thing, oh, sorry, let me, the reason why it matters is as uh, Bertha students highlighted, there's so much savings that can, can happen from reducing, you know, becoming more energy efficient. School operations are the second biggest expense after teacher salaries. We spend 65 million on electricity. We have the biggest contribution as an institution to carbon emissions with our school buses. Uh, 45 million of those silly plastic sporks end up in our waste stream every year. And green schools save money and improve health and learning outcomes. It's an absolute no brainer. So the next best thing that we can do since there is no plan in our district is the Green Apple School Program through the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. It's a relatively new program. It's been around since 2017. And like the DHS plan, it targets these key areas, energy efficiency, water efficiency, uh, alternative transportation, waste reduction, uh, and communications. That's really vital. You need to let your community know that you're pursuing these goals, then act on those goals, and then you got to give people feedback and let them know how great they're doing. So once we gave our kids the this green print, they got to work. They started recycling. They addressed the school board about reducing plastic waste. Uh, mass a student brought to the district that we weren't using those straws and they were ending up in the bay because the mass is on the bay. So they got rid of straws because no one really uses them. We installed bottle fillers throughout the campus to reduce the plastic waste. For the energy efficiency and renewable energy, our math students addressed the village of Key Biscayne and petitioned to get solar on the PE shelter because it's a shared facility with the village of Key Biscayne. And they gave persuasive you know, remarks about how the best way to get people to change their behavior is to see their neighbors do it. Education alone is not an indicator that people will adopt better sustainability practices. You really need to get started and see your neighbors doing it to create uh, faster change. Electric buses, uh, our student who was in sixth grade at the time uh, presented to the school board how we can get electric school buses through the Volkswagen Settlement Fund because bus emissions and uh, idling by bus drivers is a big problem and it's a huge health hazard. So she uh, helped persuade the district to apply for electric school buses. We're getting 50 buses over the next five years through the Volkswagen, excuse me, over the next four years through the Volkswagen settlement funding. And uh, her story was the number one streaming story on the BBC in January because of her inspirational story. And leaders will listen to our kids. So here are our students. Mass was the only US Department of Education Green Ribbon School in 2019. And we went up to DC to receive our award and meet with Donna Shalala and Senator Rubio's office to ask them to please endorse policies federally that will accelerate green schools in Florida. So what is, what is it that you guys can do today? You can help your school become a Florida Department of, Edu uh, Department of Environmental Protection Green Apple School. There's a website, the application is not too onerous but it creates a threshold of operations and a baseline of information of how your school should operate. So for instance, for waste reduction, there might be six things that you should do and you only have to pick three out of the six. And after you become qualified, then you can scale up to become a bronze, silver or gold uh, school based on the additional environmental programs that you incorporate into your school setting. You can also ask your school member, insist that we commit to 100% renewable energy 
uh, by 2030 plan like they have done in Los Angeles and Seattle. And I want to announce to the group, it's very exciting, two school board members are actually contemplating elevating this type of resolution. So we really need your support to reach out to them to say, yes, we want a commitment to 100% renewable energy because school board members are elected and elected officials, they don't create political will, they respond to it. So we have to show them that this is something that we want in our community. That's uh, another awesome. thing. <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you. No, these are all great ways for us to get involved and I'm really glad you shared these opportunities with us. Thank you so much. All right, so Ms. Clement, um, let's hear a little bit more about what you do too about combating climate change. I know we heard you speak for a second there, but I'd love to hear more. So um, Ms. Drucker, if you could please stop your share so that Ms. Clement could do hers. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Okay, should be should be able to see my um, PowerPoint now. Awesome, I can see it just fine, thank you. Okay, so I was gonna talk just a little bit about my own personal journey on this on this topic of climate change. And my path began um, with, uh, in 1988, this article that came out in the New York Times it was reporting on um, Jim Hansen was a, was a professor at Columbia University and he testified to Congress that climate change was happening now, the world was gonna keep getting hotter. If you note the date, June 24th, 1988, um, I was just about to start my senior year in high school and I was um, really motivated by this, um, what at the time was a new finding that, that um, new scientific evidence that the world was warming. Um, actually, if you'll notice some of the same issues are on the cover of the front page of the New York Times even today. So um, just a note to the, you know, the people who are the, the youth who are interested in this topic that um, these are topics that take generations um, to solve. And um, your involvement in this process is super critical. So I'm just so happy to be here and be part of this, um, this whole event. So my path began here with, um, with, um, Jim, with this congressional testimony. I ended up going to Columbia University where Jim Hansen was one of my professors and um, studied uh, physics in college and um, was always taking classes about climate change and trying to, um, trying to uh, get involved and then when I graduated from high school, I got the advice to become an expert. Um, you can't do anything in this world unless you become the expert on something. And I'm here to say that that's true, both true and not true. Um, so I will, um, I'll just talk a little bit about how my path has become kind of a circle. So starting with this, I was told to become an expert. So I got, um, I got my, I, my undergrad degree and my PhD. Um, in studying climate and understanding the um, understanding the climate system going back millions of years, going forward hundreds of years and even thousands of years, and also understanding what we're doing today. And I can tell you that it's been an absolutely amazing life and career. Um, so I, uh, you'll be hearing from our graduate students in the next session. And I just want to say that those of you that are interested in research, it is... Uh, the best thing you can ever imagine, pursuing your passion of, of just asking the question, why, 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 and then actually being able to answer those questions at your fingertips. Um, uh, the, my career took me to Paris, where I did a, uh, where I worked at the University of Paris for several years, and then I ended up back here in the University of Miami. Now, all this time, I've been doing really fundamental research on climate change. Um, and again, I was looking at times in the past uh, when sea level was higher because of natural causes. And I was, looking, um, I was looking at trying to understand the role of the ocean and the atmosphere and the ice and the land and the, and the biosphere and the geosphere and putting all these pieces together was super interesting. But all the while asking myself, um, all the while having two kind of almost existential questions. Why am I doing this? And two, having the existential question of people don't believe me. Um, in fact, I can tell you that, um, that I've been, you know, 
over this long career of thir almost 30 years now, um, have actually you know, been threatened and um, been told to be quiet, you shouldn't be talking about these things. So you know, that kind of climate denialism we hear about, um, it really affected many people in my field in really profound ways. Um, and when I first moved to Miami, um, it, you know, that, that question of, you know, why am I doing this? Who cares? When I talk to people, um, I often get the reaction, well, I'll believe climate change. I'll believe this is happening when I can see it. Well, guess what? That happened. Um, living in Miami, I've been here since 2001. And um, as everyone here knows that the seawater comes into the streets on a regular basis and that will continue to happen and will accelerate in the future. This is an article that came out just this week in New York Times um, reporting on Miami's um, one year report of the, the resilient 305 strategy. So this is a, um, uh, what, what has become for me in a way a full circle, I got motivated to do something about this problem. I went off and became an expert asking kind of esoteric questions about you know, why and why. And now here I am at ground zero for climate change and um, where my expertise can actually really help answer questions about what should we do about it here and what can we do about it um, even, uh, uh, what do we need to do about it um, on, a, on a regional, national, global scale. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go really quickly. I just want to, you know, there's, I want to mention, you've heard uh, super fabulous to hear from um, Ms. Vasquez and Ms. Drucker about um, the work that they've been doing, acting collectively. We know we all have individual choices. My choice in terms of sustainability is I'm a big bike enthusiast. So Michelle, if you ever want to um, want any engagement on biking, I'm in. Um, I have biked to work for 20 years and this is my bike ride basically, which you can see is a, a pretty fabulous. Um, Here's the Rosensteel School here. Um, I will urge you, encourage you all to come, um, come to the University of Miami and take classes and visit us here at the Rosensteel School. We have amazing resources, including a, a wind wave interaction tank that can simulate category five conditions in this building right here. Uh, we also have a new diving facility uh, where, uh, where so we have the scientific diving classes there. Um, you may hear more from that from our students in the next panel. Um, and so I, I just want to just wrap, wrap up by saying, you know, we all have individual actions we can do. We hear about collective actions, um, the kind of work Michelle and, and Bertha have been doing and in the school system. And um, on, for my part, um, I've been very involved with the City of Miami's Climate Resilience Committee. This is our website here up in the corner um, and a number of different local organizations, some of which have been mentioned here. I'm on the board of directors of Miami Waterkeeper. I've been heavily involved with Catalyst, Leo, Miami Climate Alliance. Yeah. Amazing resources in those, in those um, organizations here to get involved with those. And I'll just mention, you know, we, you know, we, have, we have to scale up um, the only way, the only thing to do about climate change is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think we all know that. Um, the uh, New city of Miami has just released this week their greenhouse gas reduction plan. This is the website that you can go to. They're having a number of public meetings now that you can participate and make your voice heard. Um, and I will say that um, the youth climate um, movement that came out of Clio Institute and um, has really made their voice heard in both of these in, in the city government. Um, the city government listens to its, its members and, and they, they want input from, from the youth. And um, there's a lot that, uh, there's a lot that you can um, get involved with locally. And I'll, I'll just stop there because I want to make sure there's time for questions awesome. for everyone. Yes. Um, Thank you so much. Oh my God, that is awesome. And what a bike path. Oh my God, <laughs> that's <laughs> beautiful. That's so cool. All right, so we do have time for a few questions. So I want everybody to send in as many questions as you can. Some super cool questions. And our first question is for you, Amy Clements. What is it that you teach in Rasmus oh. or at UM? Great question. Well, I see three of my students who I've had in class. Actually, no, I haven't had Kurt in class. I teach, um, right now I'm teaching a class called Climate and Society. Um, it's actually a, a, a pilot class where we're, we're, we're looking at climate adaptation from an interdisciplinary perspective. So it's being taught by myself, a policy analyst, a communication scientist, um, a geologist, an architect, 
and a librarian. And um, we all um, we all give lectures about um, the different dis disciplinary expertise that we can bring to it. And then we've been developing a method um, for community engagement where we get we give people cameras and ask them to tell stories um, through a method called photo voice. So this is a way to ask people in the community like you all, what do you see happening? Um, what do you see our strengths and um, of, of your neighborhood? What are opportunities for, for growth? And where are there threats to your neighborhood? So I teach about that side of climate. And then I also teach um, undergrad classes on atmospheric thermodynamics and atmospheric dynamics. Um, those are more like the physics side of things for me. And then I also teach about climate change um, and you can, um, you'll hear my, stu my students in the next panel, climate change um, for undergrads and grads. Awesome, thank you so much for answering that question. That was a great job. All right, our next question for Ms. Vasquez, are you optimistic about the future in our relationship with climate change? You know, if, you, if you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said no. There's actually a New York Times article I was interviewed. It's like, how to teach climate change without scaring children half to death. It's not an easy thing to do. In class, I have to be more optimistic than I feel. But I do this project every year where students study alternative energies. And they have to look at the cost per kilowatt hour of the different alternative energies, like solar and hydroelectric. And they have to compare the percentage of the world and the percentage of specific countries that are now using these um, alternative energies. And I have seen a big, big shift in the last two to three years. And once the economy moves, once those market forces move, and they are, you know, coal, I don't care how many times the president yells out, we're going to bring back coal, even with the best of intentions, that's not happening. They couldn't save the candle makers, okay, when the light bulb was invented. So I think the big deal is the, the economy is changing. And once we start, like people said earlier in the earlier panel, the carbon tax, we can actually put money in the pockets of Americans with the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, um, which they're looking for congressional sponsors right now for that. Once we see that happening and the market forces make this move forward, I, I'm more optimistic. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Th thank you for your responses and the time you're taking to answer these questions. Guys, do we have any more last questions? We probably have time for one more little question. So send it in the chat, send it in the Q&A. Um, Ms. Drucker, when can we start doing a job related to climate change? Interesting question. Um, you can start now by being a lobbyist because um, your voice makes a difference. You don't have to have a formal education to let the decision makers know that this is important to you. And I did put in the chat a Green Schools WhatsApp chat where we're looking for voices to create a little video um, from students that will say they want to see 100% clean energy by 2030 with our school board. So that's a way you can get started today. Thank you. Yes, totally, guys. You can get started today and work towards that future in climate change and fighting back. And there are so many different career options that lead to climate change because climate change's effects are so widespread. So thank you, everybody. Round of applause for our amazing women on the panel. Thank you guys so Wait, much for coming here today. You are an amazing moderator. Oh. <laughs> You're really, really good yeah. at this. Thank you so much. Thanks for the you opportunity. Enjoy the rest of the day. Of course. We're so grateful to have you here. Have a great day, guys. Thank you for coming on. Woo! Love them. Show them some love in the chat, guys. Thank you so much. All righty. So next up, we're going to be doing our workshop breakout session. To do this, I want all of you to do the same thing you did this morning. You're going to leave here and you're going to look at the HOVA agenda and you're going to look at the descriptions and you're going to pick a workshop that sounds super interesting to you. Um, one of the workshops will be taking place in this Zoom webinar. If you do want to hear the panel about studying climate sciences and going to college in climate sciences, we have some university students here today to teach you about that and to talk to you about that. So if you want to do that workshop, stay right here. If you're a panelist for that workshop, stay right here. Everybody else at 
go ahead, leave this Zoom and pick one of the other four workshops we have in our agenda. So awesome, big. I'll give you guys a minute.